This is the Investor Connect podcast program. I'm Hall T. Martin. I'm the host of the show in which we interview angel investors, venture capital, family offices, private equity, and many other investors for early stage and growth companies. I hope you enjoy this episode. Investor Connect is a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to the education of investors and startups for fundraising. Please consider donating $100 to the program to help others in their investor and entrepreneur journey. You can find the donate button on the InvestorConnect.org website. Well, hello, this is Hall Martin with Investor Connect. Today we're here with Eric Stegman, managing partner at Tribus Capital. Tribus Capital provides advisory services and investment in early stage prop tech companies. The fund looks to leverage the network effect of the Tribus portfolio, which has relationships with nearly 100,000 realtors across the USA and Canada. Eric, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Hall. I'm excited to be here. Great. So tell us more about your background. What did you do before you started investing? So uh, I actually started selling real estate uh, to pay to go to college. I, I don't imagine I would be doing this till 20 something years later um, and uh, kind of got stuck in this industry. Uh, I figured, OK, well, what's a job I can do in college? I went to Northwestern University in Chicago and back 20 something years ago, it was for, even then $45,000 a year to go there. Uh, Mom and dad didn't have $45,000 to pay, and I didn't want to leave college with a whole bunch of student debt. So I I said, hey, what's something I can do in my off hours on weekends, things like that, when I'm not studying or writing papers or things like along those lines? And I found real estate. Uh, A buddy of mine said, hey, I I found this real estate thing. Do you want to try to do this? I said, sure, why not? If nothing else, I'll learn something. And uh, got into it, started selling real estate uh, after hours and made about four times in my first year of what I was going to make in, at, with an engineering degree uh, 20 something years ago. So got into the business and uh, uh, fell in love with it, fell in love with the fact that it's, it rewards people who hustle and work hard uh, and uh, did, did uh, pretty well with that, then started my own brokerage. We grew it to be the largest independent real estate brokerage in St. Louis, Missouri, which is where I'm originally from, and uh, uh, sold that but kept the tech. Um, And then we started 12 years ago, Tribus, uh, which is a a software company focused on medium and large size real estate brokerages. And then spun out from that, uh, we started making investments in uh, early stage other prop tech companies, real estate technology companies and uh, uh, have had some high profile uh, exits, including one we, uh, company we sold to Zillow after only about seven months in existence. So, um, you know, that's gone really well. So my day-to-day uh, is, uh, um, you know, h- half running the, the real estate brokerage software division uh, and then half uh, doing investments and uh, advising our entrepreneurs and our portfolio companies. Great, so what excites you right now? Well, the real estate technology space is is just absolutely on fire. Um, I actually gave a presentation to 72 of the largest brokerages in the country uh, two days ago. And in that presentation, I happened to pull up some figures on investment in the space. And so in 2016, in all of prop tech uh, companies, there was only about $7 billion invested and in 2019, it was uh, over $30 billion. So just in the course of about three years, uh, you're talking a multi-X you know, X increase in the, the amount of investment in the space. You've had companies like Compass on the brokerage side, tech-enabled brokerages that have come out. You've had uh, companies like Open Door raise billions of dollars that are focused on iBuying, um, which I'm sure we'll probably talk a little bit more about later on. Um, and then just general real estate technology companies that are out there. It, it seems like the investment world kind of forgot about the space for, for a long time or, or certainly had blinders onto the space for a long time. And then suddenly between uh, probably in about 2017, 2018, it was, oh, wait a minute. This is the, the largest capital in the country is actually in people's homes. Uh, and uh, maybe we should take a look at this space. And so everything inside of the space right now is really exciting. There's been more change in the space in the past three years than probably in the previous 30 years combined. Uh, and so everything in the space is pretty pretty exciting these days. Great. Well, you see a lot of startups in the prop tech sector and a lot of investors. What's your advice for people investing in startups in this space? What do you tell them to do before they write that check? Well, um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I have a saying. Uh, so we get 
calls all the time to us to invest for us to invest at Tribus Capital to invest in companies. And I always tell the entrepreneurs the first call is free uh, and uh, uh, happy to chat with them and, and give them some advice. And so any other investor that's out there, um, I would say to really learn the space. Um, and if you're not, if you don't have a, a competency in the real estate space at all, uh, and it, you think you know enough just because you've bought and sold some homes before, uh, I would say step back for a minute. There's been a number of private equity firms uh, that have lost their rears um, over the past few years investing in this space, thinking, oh, we're going to change this, or we're going to change that, or MLSs aren't needed anymore, or, or um, hey, we can just go get all the real estate data and do some new big thing with it, um, or, oh, we're going to disintermediate real realtors overnight, uh, and nobody's going to need them anymore if they just follow you know, this new tech thing that we're going to roll out. And in every one of those circumstances, you've seen them just lose millions of dollars. In fact, a very well-funded company uh, resorted last year to just suing everybody. And I think uh, I think most most investors would agree if your business philosophy is sue everybody, you're probably probably not in a in a good spot. And uh, that company actually had to lay off. I think it was like half the staff. Uh, late last week sometime uh, because of the problems that we're going through. So my, my advice to an investor in the space is, is simply just, you know, just do your homework. And if you don't fit, you know, if you haven't spoken with realtors, spoken with MLS software people, spoken with owners of brokerages, um, spoken with people that have gone through the space and had, you know, good and bad exits, um, then you you probably don't know the space and I'd highly advise you to 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 not invest in the space because it is fraught with landmines. Great. Then on the other side of that table, what's your advice for people running startups in this sector? What do you tell the founder to do before they go out to raise funding? Uh, it's not as e- make sure your your game plan is solid. It's not nearly as easy of a space to enter as you think it is. Um, you know, I said the thing about the first call free. Uh, and so I, I probably take on average, maybe five to five to eight calls a month from entrepreneurs um, that say, oh, well, you've had exits, you've done this, you've done that. Um, you know, would you invest in our company? And I say, let's get on a call and learn a little bit more first um, on that phone call of, of what your experience is. And, and I think the number one mistake that I see uh, entrepreneurs that are starting up uh, inside of real estate or real estate technology companies is their assumption is that the data is free because in a lot of other industries, you know, data is more or less free or you can legally scrape data. And, and uh, a big thing that we see with, with prop tech companies is their assumption is, Oh, well, we can just get the data from Zillow or we can get the data from realtor.com or something like that. And it's just not how the, how it works in the industry. There's uh, copyright problems. Um, there are 625 plus MLSs in the United States alone. That's not even counting Canada. 625 MLSs in the United States. You have to go to each one of them independently of each other and get uh, approval. They can they can uh, unilaterally decide, hey, we don't like you, Eric, and we're gonna not give you access to the data. And there's pretty much nothing you can do about that. Um, so just make sure your I's are dotted, T's are crossed, and that you've budgeted in the multi-million dollars a year that it takes to go out and get the real estate data before you go to the next step of whatever whatever your business model is. So that's, if I could tell everybody listening, if, if I could just uh, have them check into that before I take the first call, I would save eight hours a month uh, uh, of talking to entrepreneurs and and probably nine out of 10 of them realizing that their model isn't going to work if they can't get the data for free. Great. Well, that's good advice. So you talked a little bit about the uh, current landscape there, but can you dive into a little bit further about the state of investing in this industry is, and how do you think the industry is evolving? Uh, you, you know, investment, I think uh, what what's happened over the past few years is, is a lot of private equity firms, uh, venture firms have used the shotgun approach, which in a lot of places in investing and particularly in a B2C businesses, uh, and a lot of what happened in Silicon Valley, shotgun approach is, is a fairly effective model if you have the capital to do it, because you invest, you know, a few million dollars here, a few million dollars there, a few million dollars here, a few million dollars there, and one of them hits big. And, you know, out of the 25 million that you invested in five companies, one of them hits and, you know, your payback isn't 25 million, it's 250 million or more, right? 
Um, the problem in the real estate space is uh, that there's not there's there's lots of room for five and ten million dollar companies, uh, which isn't exciting for for the majority of venture investors that are out there or private equity firms that are out there. There is very small uh, space in in uh, real estate and real estate technology for the multi hundred million dollar companies. Um, and so from that perspective, uh, I think what you're seeing now is some folks that got in in that in that what they thought was a gold rush in 2019 are finding out that it may not have been as exciting or as quick money as what they were expecting it to be. And you're starting to see uh, dispositions where uh, a private equity company is selling off their stake for pennies on the dollar to a different private equity company that's going to go in and take over that organization and more or less just collect on the revenues and the contracts that are that are there. There's there's a number of firms in real estate technology that that's their focus is, um, you know, we we, uh, we have a, a joke about a couple of them. It's like where companies go to die, uh, meaning that the the founder you know realizes that the upside potential isn't isn't as big as what they expected the tam isn't as big as um, of what they expected the private equity or the uh, venture investors realize that it's it's not as a quick win as what they were expecting and so they're willing to just cut their losses and move on and there are companies out there that uh, are in this space that that absolutely just specialize in this and and will go out and buy any of these companies for essentially you know two or three times uh, revenue um, and uh, just collect on it for a couple of years and and rake their money back and then anything anybody that sticks around after that great they're making profits on it um, but you know it's it's uh, it's not going to be a, a a company that receives a lot of investment or or a push on their technology going forward. So we're starting to see those come around that that uh, some firms are realizing the mistakes. And anytime there's a down, uh, you know, a disposition or a down round or something like that, um, I think it's made a lot of other investors in the space wake up uh, and say, hey, there's it's not as easy money uh, as, as what it happens to be. Um, on the converse side of that, from the actual real estate side, I think what you're seeing is the average brokerage is waking up to alternative modeling, not necessarily in terms of commissions per se, but in terms of um, companies like Open Door do have some value. I think a lot of brokerages 10 years ago um, or six years ago uh, when Open Door really started to have their rise, um, they would say, oh, well, you know, yeah, you could sell to Open Door, but it's no different than selling to, um, Paul, do you remember uh, Home Investors and Ugg Buys Ugly Houses? Yes, yeah, um, those guys. Yeah, so so I mean they're still around. They were essentially the very first eye buyer uh, that existed uh, in in any kind of large capacity. Uh, but they would offer sixty cents on the dollar, more or less, uh, mm -hmm. for properties. And I think Open Door, when it first started, when it when you actually got down to it at the end of the day, that's kind of the the ballpark that they were in uh, six, seven, eight years ago. But today we're in a totally different ballpark. Open Door and Zillow and Zillow Offers. Uh, which is their iBuyer program, um, they're offering at or above competitive market rates for properties just to get inventory uh, and to have deal flow come through them. Uh, and in fact, you know, there's there's some talk in the space about Zillow uh, and their stock price is now trading based upon those properties, even though they may lose money on each individual property and may not be profitable. The sheer fact of revenue growth is is increasing or was increasing at least for a while Zillow stock price. So it made sense for them to take more or less any deal that came along as long as it, you know they were losing within a certain, uh, certain range. Uh, but I think brokers are starting to see that and recognize, okay, well, it's no longer the home investors of buys ugly houses. It's you know, this is a, a a real opportunity to help our sellers and get them top dollar for their pricing. Um, and then, you know, then the, the agent can help them on the buying side of the transaction. So that, that's the kind of the two big things that I'm seeing. Great. And so let's talk about your investment thesis. You talked about investing in prop tech deals and you have a certain thesis and criteria. Tell us more about that. We really focus on the very, very early stage. In, in some cases, even just an idea stage uh, company is where we look at. And the reason why is if you go back to what I said just a couple seconds ago there about there's lots of room for the five and $10 million companies. There's not a lot of room for the hundred plus million dollar companies. We're really looking for the entrepreneurs and to advise them early on uh, to get in, to give them you know seed stage capital, 
uh, to get the idea off the ground, to to do a run, to to actually try to sell it to agents, sell it to brokers, um, for us to put it through and follow our network effects inside of Tribus with working with about one out of 10 realtors in the United States use one product or another of ours. Um, and so uh, in, in, in that, we want to connect with them very early on. We want to be their primary and in most cases, their only investor. Um, and we're looking for them to, to, we want that, uh, we want that this, the single or the, you know, team of entrepreneurs, the founders of the company, we want them to retain a 50 uh, plus or more percent ownership because then growing it to a $10 million company, if they can do that in two or three years, they're walking away with 5 million bucks perhaps. And it's a quick win. They're getting quick wins. Uh, and I, I think, you know, outside of venture capital and, and Silicon Valley venture capital and everything like that, if you asked an average person on the street, if you had a really good idea, and if in two years from now, you could execute on that idea, turn it into a five or $10 million company where you're walking away with, with five, you know, half of that, uh, would you take that opportunity? And I think most people would would say yes all day, every day uh, to that, that they could make, you know, essentially two and a half million dollars a year uh, with coming up with these ideas and executing on the ideas. And that's what I say, there's lots of room in this space for the five and $10 million company. There's just not a lot of room for the $100 million company. So by finding them early, by talking to them in that idea stage or, or very early stage, uh, we can be their primary investor and kind of guide them to this position of, you know, don't think of it as I'm going to build a $100 million company and it's going to take me 10 years to build it. Think of it as I'm going to build a two-year company and I'm going to get it to $5 million and be able to sell it off as a, as you know, a feature into some other larger organization that can write me a check for $10 million, no problem. So that's really what we look for. We have some other companies that we have invested in that we, that has, have grown larger than that. But um, those types of companies we found we can't provide nearly as much value for advisory and for the network effect of being able to present them and say, hey, look, what if I could grow, you know, you're, you're at an idea stage. What if we go and present this to our clients and we, we take you from zero MRR to 50,000 MRR in your first 60 days, right? I, a lot of entrepreneurs would love that. Um, uh, cause then obviously they can take those cash, that cash and just start investing it and, and, you know, bringing on more team members and growing faster. Um, and that's, that's what we focus on is where we provide that extra value beyond just writing a check. Right. Can you talk about one or two, two startups that fit that thesis and maybe portfolio companies? Sure. So, uh, a, a company that we invested in, uh, a, back in 2013, it's actually what started Tribus Capital is, uh, we had somebody come up to us, uh, come up to me personally at an event and said, hey, look, uh, we've got this really good idea um, and uh, we want to execute on it. And we we have this idea because we've been working on um, MLS data for the past couple of years um, and we, we think we have a pretty good idea. Can we talk through it with you? And I said, sure. Um, you know, let's sit down, we chatted through everything. And uh, in the process of going through that, what we realized is that their idea was uh, was a was a, a diamond that needed some slight refinement, uh, and we ref refined it and and uh, uh, and everything like that. Brought it out with an idea to the market, had a working demo, uh, but still needed some more work on it. And uh, within seven months, Zillow liked the idea so much uh, of where we were going and tr and trying it. The concept was to normalize all MLS data through a single feed where any other prop tech company could go to a single feed and get all of the MLS data from that single feed. Um, all the data normalized, it's, it's, we, we have 625 feeds uh, that have to be normalized these days. Um, but that company was called Retsley and uh, Tribus was the primary investor uh, early on. And uh, the company was in existence from the date that the, uh, the first kind of demo product worked till the date of acquisition was just under eight months. Um, seven, seven and a half months or so. And uh, I'm not allowed to disclose how much it sold for, but uh, it was a good chunk of change. Uh, the, the founders were incredibly happy um, with, with, uh, with what happened in seven months. So it's a perfect example of my investment thesis of, you know, it doesn't have to be a $100 million company. I think any entrepreneur that would, would be out there would have been happy with what they walked away with in seven months worth of work. Um, and, uh, that was a good one. So Retsley, uh, was, was, uh, one of our, our, our great exits, uh, where we can talk about the exit, uh, not necessarily how much it sold for. We have another, uh, company that we have a portfolio company right now called MapTrack. MapTrack is a, is a really interesting company. Um, 
It, uh, it actually uses uh, data from your browser, uh, uses data from your computer, your IP address. And there's other companies that do something similar, but not to the extent of what these folks do. Um, there was a company called, I think it's Toro or eToro, um, based out of Nashville. And, and they have IP addresses to tell you who they think the person on your website is. Uh, but uh, what MapTrack does is it maybe has a lower match rate than what the IP-based matching is, but it's it, it's right over 99% of the time, whereas those IP-based matching services um, have a higher match rate, but they're, they're inaccurate pretty often because obviously your home IP address changes. Um, most people don't even know uh, when it happens, but but usually it's once a month, if not more often than that. So it tells you that. So imagine for a realtor, that's out there to be able to know who's on their website or what uh, what the addresses of folks on their website uh, happen to be, or a mortgage company that says, "Hey, look, uh, you know who filled out to get mortgage uh, rates on our website without them filling out a form? We know who that person happens to be." Uh, and about thirty percent of the time, that this company can tell you that information. They work with magazines, car dealers now as well, uh, where it's you go to a car dealership website. If if you've ever gotten one of those postcards that says, "Hey, Hall, we're looking to buy your 2017 Lexus, uh, a, a car, you know, a 2016, 2017, 2018 Lexus, uh, whatever you know model it happens to be." If you have one of these vehicles, call us. Well, there's a good chance that that might be Mount Track software because we you know, in pulling that data and that 30%, not only we know the address, but we know all the makes and models of the uh, cars registered at that house. So a, a dealer can go and do that and pull that data. So that's a that's a really slick um, uh, company and, and a couple of good examples there for you. Great. Well, we heard about the challenges in the space during the uh, advice portion. Can you dive into that a little bit further and tell us what is the challenge that startup faces in launching a business in the prop tech sector? So data is not free. Um, that's probably the biggest thing is everybody thinks they can just go get the data for free and all the MLS data and all the sold data. Um, but there are 625 MLSs in the United States. Each one of them owns the copyright to that data. So you have to go and make uh, arrangements with each individual MLS. Um, so you can't just go say, I'm going to turn my product on nat nationally uh, overnight. You have to go to each MLS where they work and to go and get that data independently from each one. And, and there may be illegal scrapers that are out there that are stealing the data that you might go find in the short term to get some data up and running um, that are out there. But uh, in most cases, those are found pretty quickly. And, and uh, you never want to build your entire foundation of your business on stolen, uh, uh, anything stolen, right? Um, so that's that's certainly a big one. Also, the other big thing that I see um, as challenges in the space too is, uh, you know, it, there's that old saying, the riches are in the niches. Uh, and a lot of people say, oh, well, there's, you know, a niche here of real estate and there's 1.5 million realtors with another million people on top of that that just have a real estate license but ne aren't necessarily realtors. Uh, and so you get to this world where, one in every 150 people in the United States or one in every 100 people in the United States has a real estate license. Um, and you say, okay, well, you know, one in every 100 people I, is essentially in my addressable market. Um, the problem is, is connecting with those people and the churn rates that companies tend to find uh, in connecting with those individual agents. Uh, often, you know, like for example, CRM. Uh, CRM, I've seen tons of companies come out and offer CRM for realtors and say, oh, we're going to make a you know, the next CRM. And, and what's happened is it's been a race to zero in terms of what uh, these companies can charge for their CRM product, because so many of them have come out to try to connect with this niche uh, that's out there. And so it's a race to race to zero. More importantly than that is uh, agents can be fickle uh, with their technology decision-making purposes. So uh, they could sign up for your CRM this month, during your free trial, they could turn on for a couple of months and your data shows, well, if I keep them for three months, then they'll, they'll probably stick around. The problem is um, th that modeling doesn't always work that great because there's so many outside factors uh, that you can't control in terms of getting them to sign up. You know, people, uh, tech companies often think of them more like a B2C because there's so many of them and they have the direct relationship with the realtor. But the truth is, is it's not really a B2C um, and it's not even a B2B 
because uh, the other thing that can happen is their broker comes out and says, hey, look, I've purchased you a great CRM and everybody's going to get it free. Well, now all the people that use that, that CRM they were paying for directly say, I don't need you anymore, right? And, and you could lose 1,000 clients, 2,000, 5,000 clients or paying customers. You could lose them essentially overnight. Uh, so there are a lot of landmines in the space, uh, you know, and that goes back to my advice if you're a founder, which is find, a, find an advisor, find investors uh, that know the space really well, whether that's, you know, calling us or whether that's um, any of the other investors that are in the space, just find those because they'll be able to present you and look at your, uh, your modeling and say, wait a minute, you know, you've got a 3% churn rate for selling something direct to agents. Your churn rate might be 30%, you know, a 10 time churn rate uh, because of what can happen um, in, the, in this space. Well, we're at the top of the stock market right now. It's very frothy, lots of money available. But uh, so what are the challenges in this space for the investor? Of course, we've had a run up in, in real estate prices and, uh, you know, nobody really knows what's going to happen over the next year or two uh, with those real estate prices. My, my take is uh, that we're going to see a plateau, uh, not necessarily a bubble. I don't think that we're in a bubble, particularly because during 08, you know, so many percent, so much percentage of the home ownership that was out there, nobody had any money down. So it was easy to walk away from everything. Now, um, you know, almost 30% of transactions in the United States are cash transactions, number one. Number two is um, the ones that aren't cash transactions, um, the average down payment amount, you know, is, is through the roof uh, because of lending requirements lately. So I don't think we're going to see a huge foreclosure crisis, but it certainly uh, could be that, uh, less homes transact or that they transact and don't have as much of a run up, uh, you know, certainly as being an iBuyer investor like uh, Open Door Zillow, I would be very, very um, uh, watching my P's and Q's here uh, because you don't want to be stuck with a whole bunch of inventory that's stagnant in terms of pricing when you've been paying top of market pricing for all of that inventory. So as a as an investor, both just from a tech standpoint or an iBuyer standpoint, or even just a general real estate investor that might be out there listening to your your uh, podcast here, um, just uh, just invest with a longer term thesis here, um, so that if there is a stagnation period that we end up with or a plateau period that we end up with, that you're not relying on the fact the home's going to appreciate thirty percent next year like it did maybe last year. Uh, so that's that's kind of that side of it. The other side of it is, you know, for for uh, for the investors, I kind of mentioned this a little bit already. Is this, if you don't know the space and you're trying to invest uh, in the real estate, particularly in the real estate technology space or the real estate brokerage space, you know, just have get somebody who's been in the the world for ten plus years. Ask them all sorts of questions. Let them try to find holes in your investment thesis. Uh, because there are so many landmines um, in the space that you may not know of that, you you know, every I you think is dotted and T is crossed and you get everything lined up and you invest in a company and they're doing great things and they think they know everything about the space. Uh, and then they get something out there and realize that the whole model falls apart. I've, I've seen that happen to multiple companies. Great. And so you see a lot of different sectors and applications inside the prop tech space. If you had to pick one or two that are Good opportunities for investors to pursue today. What would you call out? Um, I think anything in the in the particularly in the tech space. I I would have been an investor in the iBuyer space two years ago. In fact, we actually did try to uh, set up a uh, an iBuyer program that would go inside of the brokerage and work inside of brokerages. Uh, we had a couple folks working on it um, with trying to go get outside investment. You know, but the problem is you need bi literally billions of dollars of outside investment. Uh, to be able to do one of those uh, correctly. And uh, the money seemed to, to have already been flowing that was out there from BlackRock and those uh, other companies that were interested in owning the properties or, or certainly investing in real estate. The money was all flowing into you know Zillow offers or um, flowing into particularly into Open Door. Um, so a couple of years ago, I would have been in it. I was we were attempting to be an investor inside of that space. Um, today, I think the, the safe space is is in mortgage, uh, mortgage technology, mortgage uh, real estate technology. I think you know when it comes down to it. And the folks that are listening in uh, right now that are mortgage brokers or mortgage bankers, uh, sorry, but uh, um, you know, I, everybody wants to, has wanted to talk about the disintermediation of the realtor, uh, and and I just don't see that 
as inevitable at all, um, because I think you need somebody uh, that's a trusted advisor to go to to ask questions about, hey, what does this mean on the inspection report, or or what does this mean about the county rule or or the HOA rule or whatever. You need that person with that local domain experience uh, in that market or in that neighborhood even, um, and it's just hard to replace. And on the flip side of the coin uh, is mortgage, and I just don't think there is enough to to prevent the same thing or prevent a prevent disintermediation from the mortgage side. It is the same product, you know, uh, essentially mortgage to mortgage to mortgage. It's just which product you go with. And there are companies out there that are working on these sorts of problems. I mean, Rocket Mortgage is focused on on this kind of an idea, uh, but I think there's plenty of room still left in the space. Better, uh, better mortgage. Uh, a number uh, of of uh, people I know had, had invested early on in better uh, mortgage. Which just tried to digitize the entire space, where you don't have to talk to a mortgage broker and and everything like that. Um, and there is still room, I think, in that space to make the average person be able to completely obtain a mortgage, do everything needed to obtain a mortgage completely digitally. Um, Paul, I'm sure you've heard of Plaid before, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Okay, great company. I think Visa tried to buy it. And then there was some question of, of, uh, of um, uh, the antitrust side of things. Uh, and that got called off, but phenomenal company. And, and I think there's so much uh, area there for, for Plaid to, uh, for a, mortgage technology company to come in and just connect up the plaid and think about it. I just put in my, uh, my, my, uh, my banking information. I put in my stock account and, in, uh, information. I put in all of that and, uh, you can pretty easily these days pull that information, come up with, uh, aggregate data based upon it. Um, you can also use that same aggregate data to come up with credit rating for a person that maybe doesn't even need to use FICO. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly takes into account ability to pay, uh, and likelihood to pay just from, from connecting up a plaid to a system and say, yep, Paul, you know what? Great. You're approved for up to this much money. Um, and, uh, uh, you can go out there and here's your approval. And then by the way, whenever you're ready, uh, just some, you know, go to this portal, put in your contract, our, our OCR system will grab the data from the contract and, uh, we can process your mortgage essentially in, entirely digitally. I think there still is room in that space. Um, and, uh, I don't think there's a clear winner. I think rockets tried to pretend like they're a clear winner, but I think if you go through the experience with them, there's been, uh, plenty of issues and you still have to have a human regularly involved. Um, and I think there's room in the space to, 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 to get all of that out of there. And, and the little known secret of the prop tech space is the money's all in the mortgage. Mm -hmm. Um, so the average real estate brokerage makes 3% profit. Uh, um, so very low profit margin. And that's in a good year, they're making 3% profit. The money's all in the mortgage side of the business anyways. And so even if you could, if you could offer, you know, great rates and completely digitize the process, I think there's, there's a lot of money to be made there. Mm -hmm. Same thing in insurance, by the way, for that matter is, you know, it's great to have somebody to call if something goes wrong with your insurance. And I think that will always be important, but signing somebody up for insurance or binding the coverage when they buy a new home, particularly, or buy a new car. I think there's a lot of opportunity in that space too. Right. Well, in the last few minutes that we have here, what else should we cover that we haven't? You know, the real estate industry is a is an interesting animal, uh, and I know I've mentioned this a couple of times, but uh, there's there's so much, and and you know, realtors are I would just say are hardworking people. They're they're not this. Uh, for investors out there that may have read Freakonomics or any of these books that are out there, if, you, if you're not familiar with the space, realtors are very hardworking people. They know they have this extra bit of knowledge that, uh, that you know, the average, first of all, the computer probably can't uh, ever have to the level of knowing about HOA rules and knowing what will and what won't fly um, when things are subjective, particularly. Um, they also know, hey, uh, for example, in, in a particular market, um, there, when I sold homes in St. Louis, if you had a home built between a few different years, uh, there was a good chance it had a, a, um, uh, a circuit breaker box uh, made by a company called Federal Pacific. And if you had a, a Federal Pacific box, they're known for fires. So the realtor walks in and the first thing they see in there is a Federal Pacific box. And they say, hey, look, um, you know, if you do buy this house, great, but just make sure you get the, the circuit breaker box changed out before you, you take ownership of it. Those are things that become very difficult uh, for a computer system to be able to, to take out of the process. Um, but you have to remember, it's people's biggest 
biggest investments probably of their lives for the average human that's out there. You know, their stock portfolio isn't their number one investment. It's it's their uh, it's their home. And uh, people want that handholding process and and somebody to feel good about and somebody to call if something's not right or if there's a question. Uh, just like you know, if you if you talk um, growing up, my best friend, uh, her dad was the COO of Edward Jones, and you know, early punk kid me said, "Wait a minute, why do we need these investment advisors? Why do we need all of these people? Um, we can do this all online, you know." And I, I said, uh, talk to him and said, well, "Why, you know, why don't you have an online portal to go in and buy stock at?" And, uh, you know, Norm being the very, very smart man that he was uh, pretty much said, hey, look, we're selling a service. We're selling the fact that they have somebody to go to uh, in good times to invite, advise them on, hey, you can take a little more risk and uh, uh, or maybe, hey, look, you know, risk, it's getting frothy, maybe take some risk off the table. Uh, and then in bad times when there's been losses, there's somebody you go to and say, well, what do we do? How do we do this? Or, you know, we were getting ready to retire next year. What's what's our plan? Uh, and having that person to bounce those ideas off with years and years and years of experience, there's value there that's it's hard for people that typically invest in, in technology companies. It's hard for them to quantify that, but it's vital. And look how many people pay an Edward Jones advisor or pay a Merrill advisor or pay a Morgan Stanley advisor, you know, 1% a year uh, for having that person to be able to just bounce ideas off of. And I think the same thing will, will continue in the real estate space. Well, that's great. Well, so how best for listeners to get back in touch with you? Sure. So, um, you know, we uh, we are accessible at tribus.com. Um, you can you can uh, uh, you know if you're if you're in, in the brokerage business, and you want to learn more about uh, the tech side. There's there, um, but it's also tribus.com. Um, if you go to the bottom of the page, you'll see a, a VC button, and uh, you can click that. If you're thinking about starting a prop tech company, click that button. And uh, you can learn more about our uh, Tribus Capital Division, uh, where we we would uh, be interested in potentially advising and and then uh, investing in your in your company. So definitely feel free to, to reach out via that channel, um, or people can email me. I, I, uh, I like I said earlier, my, the first call is always free. So if you've got a great idea and you want to bounce it off somebody who's been in the space for twenty plus years and has pretty much done every job in the space uh, that's that's there, including uh, owning a mortgage operation previously. Um, you can feel free to email me. You can get me. It's uh, and you know, Hall. Can we put the because my name is kind of long. Uh, put it in the notes or something like that. It's Eric dot Stegeman at Tribus dot com. You can you can catch me there. Uh, e r i c dot s t e g e m a n n at Tribus t r i b u s dot com. Uh, shoot me an email. If you got a great idea, I will always take the time to jump on a call with you and, and uh, chat through and I'll help you try to find any holes. And who knows, maybe it's a fit for us to make an investment in your company. Great. Well, we'll put that in the show notes. I want to thank you for joining us today and hope to have you back for a follow-up soon. Sounds good. Thanks so much, Paul. Investor Connect helps investors interested in startup funding. In this podcast series, experienced investors share their experience and advice. You can learn more at InvestorConnect.org. Halty Martin is the director of Investor Connect, which is a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to the education of investors for early stage funding. All opinions expressed by Hall and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Investor Connect. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions.